Hey there, I'm Ryan Bomi, and you're tuning into So You Want to Teach Percussion. This video series is designed particularly for my current percussion methods students. Since they aren't able to have a typical percussion methods experience due to the current global pandemic, these videos are designed to give them a foundation of the technique outside of class time so that we have more time to play when we're together. But I also hope this video series can be helpful to any music educators out there. Although I've designed this video series for my percussion method students to learn about teaching percussion, I know that they also need to know a lot more things about being a band director that I can't teach them. So I figured it would be a good idea to share some perspectives from people who are in the field. And I'm starting with my good friend, Kirsten Hoogstraten. I first met Kirsten when we were completing our master's degrees at the University of Central Florida. Go Knights Charge On. She's an awesome person, an awesome friend, and on top of that, she's an awesome music educator having taught multiple levels of band in multiple states. In this video, I'm going to share an interview I recently did with Kirsten, where I asked her a lot of questions about teaching percussionists and also teaching during COVID. She has so much great insight and advice for current and future music educators. I definitely recommend you take the time to listen to the whole interview, but you're also welcome to check out the description and click the timestamp for any questions you're most interested in hearing answered. Without any further ado, let's go to the interview. All right, so Kirsten, uh, could you please tell us a little bit about your experience as a uh, band and or orchestra director? Yeah, um, so I have been teaching band uh, in the public schools. This is my fifth year, um, broken down between three schools. Uh, I taught for three years in a school in Kansas, central Kansas, um, called St. Mary's. Um, I taught five through 12 band, uh, and some other stuff. Um, I have taught in a town called North Brookfield, Massachusetts, where I taught five through 12 bands and some other stuff. And I'm currently teaching um, fourth grade through eighth grade band at Windy Ridge K-8 in Orange County in Orlando, Florida. Go Knights. Go Knights, charge on. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, well, would you mind getting into some of the, the other stuff that you mentioned and some of those oh, other jobs? Or? Yeah. So... Um, amongst teaching band classes, I've taught junior, junior high choir. Um, I've taught a regular high school level music appreciation and I've taught dual credit collegiate music appreciation. Uh, I've taught the jazz combo guitar class. Um, I taught drama for a year. Oh. <laughs> and uh, I've also taught at when I was getting my master's at both Central Missouri and then when I transferred to UCF, I taught collegiate music appreciation and I taught a collegiate level low brass two methods. So much like percussion methods, but trombone, euphonium, and tuba. Got it. Cool. And, and of, uh, like, at least when you were in like the, the teaching positions, not maybe not so much the master's, how much of that was like kind of your decision or was that all just kind of thrusted on you? Like, hey, you get to do this. Uh, so at my first job, I walked in and they were like, here is what you have. And so I had my band classes, which were great. My high school band only met three days a week because the other two days they were split with choir, which was changed. <laughs> By my last year, I had changed it to where I had band every day. Um, and then they were like, you have a guitar class and you have a jazz combo. They're at the same time you can decide what you want to do with them. So we did two days a week of jazz and we did th three days a week of guitar. And eventually it morphed into just a guitar class because it was the weirdest combo ever. There was like a trumpet player, a tenor saxophone, a kid who had held a guitar one time, a flute slash piano player. And that was about it. As a teacher, you say, I can make a jazz combo with anything. But when you actually have to make a jazz combo with anything, it's way more difficult. And when you say, hey guys, we could just play guitars, and they go, yeah, that sounds okay. You just play guitars, and that's fine. I didn't mind teaching guitar, it was pretty all right. Nice. Uh, uh -huh. Teaching drama was 100%. The school went, we need to add more fine arts courses. What else can you do? And I said, I did drama in high school, and they went, cool, we don't have anyone doing that. And I was already doing the school plays, so we just did a drama class. Cool. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's interesting to know that, like, because I've heard of getting, like, music appreciation classes and, like, guitar classes mm -hmm. mixed in, but, yeah, I've not heard of, like, drama and doing band and choir together so much. It's, it's interesting. Oh, yeah. 
Um, junior high choir was definitely an interesting thing. The drama class, they like had to change its name to fudge it because I'm not certified to teach drama kids. You heard it here. So they changed it and made it some semblance of a music class. But ta-da, <laughs> it was a drama class. No one needs to know. <laughs> right, yeah, <laughs> you made it. We so, did it. Yes. So moving back to band, the band side of things, on a scale of one to 10, thinking back, how well did your percussion methods course that you took in your undergrad prepare you for teaching percussionists either at high school or middle school? Okay, so much like I'm guessing, since this is originally for percussion methods, many of you might be freshmen. I took my percussion methods class first or second semester of my freshman year of college. So it was four years before I graduated and like was able to go actually teach kids percussion. So it was a while. It was taught by a grad student, a doctoral student actually, much like my friend Ryan, but his name was Julius and he was from, I think Ukraine. And so he, his musical upbringing did not go through the United States public education system. And he didn't know about like marching band and stuff. So our day of marching percussion was like, here is some videos of DCI. That is what marching band is. And every kid was like, that's not, that's not, I mean, that's, that's fancy pay for marching band. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, so I learned a lot of stuff that I still pull random bits and pieces of out of my brain sometimes. Like I can talk about timpani grips and be like, this one is this way and this one is this way. And I can be like, when you need to play fast on the tambourine, you hold it between your knee and your, like, there's different random things that I'll pull out of my brain that I learned. But you, I learned a lot more by being thrust into, I'm now a band teacher and I have kids that don't know how to play percussion. Or the band director before me was like, you play the bass drum. And that kid just played the bass drum. As we know, that's not how band's supposed to work. You're supposed to play all of the things. From my time, I, I can tell, tell you that my favorite rudiment is a triple radicue because we learned a bunch of rudiments. Um, and I know that rudiments are important to start on, like, on stuff. I can not be like, hey, kids, a triple radicue is going to help you do this. But I can go, hey, let's start working on like five stroke rolls because that's going to help you with stuff. You'll use that. I know that for a fact. But I don't know how a cheese flam's gonna help you out but i know that there's something called a cheese flam <laughs> there absolutely is yeah <laughs> so in working with a uh, beginning percussionist do you you said you kind of you know a lot about the rudiments there are some rudiments and stuff do you mm -hmm. prefer to start beginners on snare drum or mallets if i had a choice which i mean i do have a choice i'm the band director i have a choice <laughs> um i would prefer to start everyone on mallets for the first six months and then slowly work into snare drum stuff obviously at my first school renting wasn't really a big thing so kids didn't go out and rent the snare drum bell kit stuff and i did not have enough of those things to give to all the kids to play so i had to rotate um and it was purely on equipment based so i had i had a xylophone i think i had two xylophones at that school um that were at the elementary school that would i would roll out and two kids would play on the xylophones and then the other kids would play on the snare drums and we would just rotate through. At North Brookfield, which my other job, I would have the kids kind of like switch back and forth. I only had one kid who played percussion and then he quit after like the first semester. So that was fun. And then the band director that was there before me only made the kids get a snare drum. They didn't rent a bell kit. They rented a snare drum and they got the book. And so I had kids that didn't know how to play the bells and I saw them once a week for 45 minutes after school. The most ineffective way to teach beginner band possible is seeing your kids for 45 minutes once a week after school. Right, yeah. Um, but here at my job, now that I have now, which it's obviously going to be super weird due to COVID, I'm going to talk a lot about bells a lot sooner. And it's, it's a lot better here because I have kids that in my middle school band in the top group that are very keyboard percussion centric. Like one girl walked in and was like, I have missed the marimba so much you have no idea. So um, 
there's a nicer precedent at this school of kids playing keyboard percussion instruments. And I think it's easier in a big place like Orange County because there's so many other schools that kids can see. They can go to Olympia and see the giant pit. They can go to Dr. Phillips. I, I feed Olympia and Dr. Phillips. So they can go to Dr. Phillips and see the giant pit and see the kids playing those things. And then it's really intriguing for them. So there's that culture here that there hasn't been at the other places I've worked. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and that kind of takes me back to like uh, when I was in high school, I was like the snare kid. Yeah. I got to college and then and I had to like try to read mallets. And I was like, how do you do this? <laughs> what, what are these bink bonks? Yeah. It's like square one all over again. And it, it makes sense in Orlando, you know, kind of seeing some of the programs, some of the high school programs there. So it's cool. Yeah. They have like stuff to look up to and be inspired to not just stick on the drums. Yeah. Very nice. <laughs> Uh, so since becoming a band director, what are some breakthroughs you've had in regards to working with percussionists? And maybe not as much like, you know, this is what you need to know as a percussionist, but like in terms of getting them engaged in rehearsals and not having them sitting in the back and like solving Rubik's Cubes all the time. Right. <laughs> you give them too much credit. <laughs> if you were the percussion kid solving Rubik's Cubes in the back, then awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. Because I had a kid that just held symbols up in the air and was like, When? <laughs> when do I hit? <laughs> never, never put those down. This has nothing to do with students, but it is the first thing that I learned after going to my very first marching competition as a teacher was, hey, your bass drums sound like trash. And so I had to learn how to dampen and tune my own bass drums. So that's super wow. important. <laughs> yeah. Make sure your bass drums sound nice because I had to write my own drill. I had to do some rearrangements on my own music and by the time you're teaching kids stuff and you have some kids that join band that year and you're like, I don't know what I'm going to put you on. I, uh, here's a really easy bass drum part because I need more kids in the, like I need more of more people in that and you can help, at least help with something. Things will slip by and tuning the bass drums slipped by and they were like, Hey, your bass drums sound like buckets. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's hitting a trash can with a stick. So I like, that's super important. Keeping kids engaged. There have been lots of times where I've had to rewrite things um, because I just haven't had kids at the level where they're allowed to, where they're able to play them. So making sure that your music is accessible for your players. Cause I have, I've had great wins players in the past where I need to program up for those kids. But sometimes the percussion parts just aren't accessible because of the level of kid that I have. So I've had to like rewrite some certain parts so they're a little bit easier. I had a kid who she was a dancer and she was awesome and she was so dedicated and she was involved in everything and I adore her to this day. But she was so used to in her brain counting things dance wise, one and two and three mm. and breaking things down that way that she could not triplet. Got it. <laughs> so. I, we would just, and it sounded a little funky for a marching show, but you know what? Sometimes your how to train a dragon snare drum parts are just going to be in eighth notes. <laughs> <laughs> you do what you got to do. <laughs> you do what you got to do. But once I made that switch, she was able to like grasp it really fast and was fine. And then finding new interesting things for them to do. I played a piece called Old Churches, which where they play a lot of metal bowls we played some stuff that had like bowed vibraphone. And so I had to have the music store bring me a bow because we didn't have an orchestra. That yeah. was fun. So just things that weren't like super technical, crazy stuff that they got to do was really enjoyable to them. So yeah, make things accessible and then make things interesting. Awesome. I love it. So I, I've never experienced or had any experience coming up with like a band budget and I have no idea what that process is like or who to talk to at your school to and who to like be friends with at your school and stuff to make all this like happen so either in terms of budgeting for percussion instruments or really any mm -hmm. instruments kind of how how does that process sort of look okay so some places will give you a set amount of money each each year and be like this is yours to spend uh, my second school was like you have twenty five hundred dollars and I went that's not a lot of money um so I immediately went and spent $500 on miscellaneous percussion stuff because we had nothing. But now they have like a tambourine and like three triangles and all this. They have different sizes and some wood blocks and stick bags with a bunch of stuff in it. And I hope it's not ruined at this point. But so some places will give you a set amount of money. 
a lot of high schools will run their budget through their band booster program. I personally do not have experience with that because I have worked at small places that do not have band booster programs. But I do know that a lot of places will do that and their parents will like run fundraisers and all of their money will go through that and they'll be like, cool, we need to pay a tech. The band boosters will take care of it. Hey, we need to buy some new instruments. The band boosters will take care of it. Like all of that money somehow runs through these magical parents. <laughs> I don't know. That is one thing I have no idea. Got it. <laughs> my, my personal experience was be a good human being. Don't be mean, like don't like backtalk your principal or say mean things about him behind his back or her or they and just an ask because the like the worst thing can happen is that they say no usually they i have had most my most of my experience has been they said yes or they say can you see what if we could get a better price and then you kind of work from there also the pta since i'm currently in a middle school and you don't usually have like band boosters at a middle school the PTA is very good with finding money and filtering it out to places that need it. So my first thing is my school has a really nice looking marimba. It has a really okay xylophone that definitely used to be a marching xylophone for someone else. We have no vibraphone and I would very much like one. So that is my first thing for my PTA as I'm going to go, hi, the band program could really use this. This is what they look like. Here's a few options. And then I would like vet them myself and I would like, I would search out the, the vibraphones myself so they're not going on Amazon or whatever and looking for vibraphones. And I'll go, hey, Ryan, I thought these were pretty good. They looked good. And I'll go, do you think these are worthwhile vibraphones for a middle school? And he will go, yes, no, maybe. Or look at these ones. Because friends, use your friends. They're helpful. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, that's, re that's good. PTAs are good. I've also ran a, a donor's choose. Some of those things, this has nothing to do with budget, but it's a way to get stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, last school didn't have a set of bells, orchestra bells, and they had a xylophone in a box. So the xylophone in the box was fine. They, they didn't need anything that was big and crazy, but orchestra bells are small and aren't super expensive. So we did a, don a donor's choose for it. And it went on when they were doing like a donation match thing. And it was funded in three hours three hours wow yeah grants and donors choose sorts of things and stuff like that are all extra ways to get stuff but from my experience ask and pta and then just see what money you have allotted because you might have some they might just have a fund somewhere they were like this is the music budget where they're the school is just like <laughs> and you're like okay that is my experience with that Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Well, that's, like I said, that's, I had none. So that's, uh, I know a lot now about that. So that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally in the percussion specific questions, and you, you shared a lot of words of wisdom already uh, for future music, music educators. Uh, do you have anything else to share? Any other words of wisdom for future music educators who will have percussionists of their own one day? <laughs> their very own percussionists. <laughs> yeah. Make sure that you have stuff for them to do don't be afraid to, at least when they're learning stuff, because you know there's plenty of those band pieces that are like, hey, this is a ballad and it has a xylophone part. And then this one kid plays the wind chimes and that's it. Like give that xylophone part to everyone else and have them play it on a bunch of stuff because even if they're not gonna play it in the concert, it's keeping them doing something and it's working on their chops on those keyboard instruments, which is what we all want. <laughs> <laughs> and then give them like stuff to do if you trust them enough to like go off to a, a side room and work on like a percussion arrangement thing or work on a sectional don't make them sit in the room and be bored because I'm a tuba player there are plenty times when I've had to sit in a band room and be bored because I play whole notes the whole time and there's not a lot for me to do so keeping all your students their little brains running and their little hands moving will be better for you in the long run and it will make them enjoy being in your class way more because they're like oh I got to go to band and like work on a thing with my friends today as opposed to I had to go to band while well, they worked on Omanu Mysterium for 45 minutes and I did nothing. Especially in contrast to like if you if, if it's high school and they're doing marching band 
in one part of the semester and then it's you know the next part of the semester it's like sitting in the back of the room yeah exactly because they go from running around and doing like super disciplined and doing stuff and having a great time and then they're like all right cool put that away now mm -hmm. and now you have a triangle <laughs> playing the most notes to playing the very least notes yeah yeah or uh i only need uh let's see i have 17 of you in wind ensemble i need three of you for this piece so the other 14 of you uh, go work on homework don't pat on the floor it's really loud i know you're i know you're percussionist but please don't percuss <laughs> i know please percuss the least amount possible <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, well, well, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Sweet. So moving uh, away, sort of away from percussion, we can still tie percussion into this, mm -hmm. but moving to COVID specific questions. Um, because I mean, because we really don't know how long this is all going to last. And yeah. my, my students now could potentially some at least some mm -hmm. of them be kind of dealing with a lot of the same stuff. So yeah, just out of curiosity, so what does the band process look like as a whole this semester? Um, so as of right now, I have kids at both at home and at school and I teach them both at the same time, which is the hardest thing that I have ever done. And I come home every day and I'm exhausted and my voice hurts a whole lot from talking all the time. And your brain tricks you and go, does my throat hurt because I have COVID or does my throat hurt because I talk all the time and I'm wearing a mask. And so I never get to drink. It's yeah. always the second one. <laughs> it's never, it's never, I have COVID, which is thank goodness. It's I, wear a mask and in the morning I'm like drink coffee drink coffee because I'm a grown-up human being and that's what I do and then in the afternoon I'm just like well my coffee's gone who what what else is there to drink this giant cup of water is here I just never ever drink it and so like my throat hurts because I talk really loud all the time I talk really loud all the time anyway <laughs> I'm just a loud person, but I find myself talking louder because I have the kids on the, on the computer have to hear me and the kids in the room have to hear me. I have three band classes in the morning. One is this weird bonus band class that next year will not exist. I walked into this and they were like, this is bonus band. And I was like, I don't know what that is. And the kids, <laughs> I've never heard of this. And I went, hey kids, what's bonus band? And they went, well, it's just a time that we would like practice small ensembles or learn a new instrument or practice solo and ensemble stuff. And I was like, okay, so it was a no prep time. This is a free block for the teacher to meander around and help you. Okay. I mean, I had this in high school and it was called seminar. <laughs> right. Yeah. It, or like whatever weird class you had on like Tuesdays and Thursdays for that extra 30 minutes. So next year it will not be this. It'll be like sixth grade band. But so that class currently if everyone is at school has four kids in it hmm. and the kids at home, there's 13 for the past two days. I've had two kids, <laughs> Got it. Um, but I feel comfortable enough with the four of them that if they sit on completely opposite corners of the room, they are spaced out by an extensive space and they all have bell covers that we can do four people in the classroom right now for our like 30 minutes a lot amount of time and then we're done but so we're working on some like really basic easy doofy halloween piece to like give them something fun to do but it's for that class at least it's we can get some playing done at home and at school at the same time and the kids at home fingers crossed they're playing because they're gonna have playing tests where they need to like they have to play and they'll record it and the kids at home at school will also record it and they'll turn it in through Flipgrid. But I don't force kids to have their cameras on because I think it's a weird invasion of privacy thing. So I take their attendance every day, but I don't make them keep their computer on or their camera on. They have to keep their computer on. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so you hope that they're playing. And I'm like, guys, this is super honor system that you're playing your instrument right now. Um, and I've had emails from kids that are like, hey, I need help on this. Or when we did like a review thing, they were like, oh, I remembered how my trumpet works and stuff. So I do think that most of them, like the majority of them were playing. Some kids still haven't come to pick up their instrument yet and they're going to have a rude awakening. But I mean, we can't catch all of them right now. Uh, we just do what we can. And here's a good thing. If you send a kid a thing so many times, you're like, 
hey, I have put it online here. I have sent it to you. I have sent it to your parents. I have sent it to you again. Remember, this is exactly how you get to it. I'm going to share my screen and show you where it is. And I'm going to click on it. And I'm going to show you how to save it and all of this stuff. And they still do not get it. And then their parent emails you and goes, can we get this? And you email it to their parents. And then they still do not give you that form. It is not your fault. Amen. <laughs> that is no longer on you because there has to be some semblance of responsibility there. You cannot spoon feed them absolutely everything. They are young adults. And I feel like by the time you are in middle school, you have enough responsibility that you can do those things. If my fourth and fifth graders don't do something because they lose, lose an internet paper, you are nine years old. You, you are not two full hands yet. That's fine. <laughs> I will help you nine year old student. But by the time you're 13, if you still don't have your instrument and it is September 22nd, at this point, it is not my fault. <laughs> so you cannot do everything. Sometimes kids are just dumb. Okay, I'm gonna get off that soapbox. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah, they, 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 gotta, they gotta tie their own, uh, tie their own shoes, so to speak. They gotta yeah. tie their own shoes, yeah. You have to, they have to do their own things. And especially if they're at home, like I can't babysit you at home all the time. Like I'm giving you as much as I can back to band. So we're doing a lot of <laughs> online stuff. I put all my pieces in the finale in chunks. Um, and then I make practice tracks with this four person class spaced in corners of my rectangular shaped band room. I will play the track on the computer and then the kids in class will play and the kids at home will play along with the track. Um, the recordings all have four measures of empty click in front of them, which there has to be an easier way to do this. I don't know it. Some of your kids in your class are going to think that I'm stupid. I have a crummy school computer that I can't put Audacity on. And I have a ancient laptop of my own that was literally from 2010. And I'm saving up money to get a new one. Don't judge me. It will not run Audacity well enough for me to put things together and put a click track on it. So I put it in finale and I just run like an entire percussion track <laughs> of like rim shots underneath it oh yeah so there's my click track but then it also changes tempo with the song yeah so and i just put four empty bars at the beginning and i put rim shots through those and there you go there's my click track my band kids can play along and when they make videos i told them all to count on the third bar of clicks they have to say one two three four and then come in and play when they're supposed to i can line up their counting Mm -hmm. And then that's how we'll hopefully, fingers crossed, make this virtual band video that everyone loves slash hates <laughs> of Halloween medleys. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. So that class is doing that. Before we played, before the bell covers came in, we did a lot of music history stuff. And this is in the other classes too, the other two classes that I have that are like concert band, lower band and higher band, concert band and symphonic band. Uh, we did a lot of music history. I got to do a bunch of, since we're all doing Halloween-y type things, because that gives us plenty of time to prepare, gives them plenty of time to record, and then gives me time to put it together before Halloween. And it's not shoving too much onto their plate, being like, oh, we have to pr a concert of seven songs to prep for. Right. One thing. One thing is good enough for now. Oh, yeah. I got to teach them about the composers of the Halloween piece, like the spooky music and the medleys. So they learned about Gounod, they've learned about Mozart, they've learned about Bach, they've learned about Modest Mussorgsky. So like we got to do some cool, interesting Halloween learning. They learned about Grieg, I forgot, they learned about Grieg. Okay. And then I try to find little like cartoony things or fun ways that people have played the music or put it to cartoons or something. And then we watch the video of it. And so they get to hear the actual version. And so say like certain things were written just like straight up for piano. So Toccata and Fugue, everyone's original like spooky song. We started off like, I was like, this is what it sounds like on organ. And so I found a video of a guy playing organ and you can see like how when he plays on the middle keyboard, it also activates the bottom keyboard. And when he plays with his feet, it does this thing. And so they're like, wow, that's crazy my church has an organ and I was like, is your church gigantic? And they're like, well, no. And I'm like, it might not have a real organ because they're huge. Um, but then we also listened to the, the Stokowski orchestration of it because it's used in Fantasia and everyone loves Fantasia. In Orlando, uh, especially. There you in go. North, right. <laughs> um, but so we did a lot of that sort of stuff. And then we've done some note review and we've done some rhythm review 
there's some cool stuff that you can use called there's like a place called boom cards which is cool it's got some online stuff we did the google chrome music lab they had to listen to a song and then by ear put it out on the google chrome lab and put like a percussion track to it cool. so we've done some stuff we did a graphic scores unit mm -hmm. um where we listened to first we listened to vesuvius by frank to kelly we talked all about it and then we listened to vesuvius by frank to kelly and they had to come up with what their graphic score would look like as a class and then the next time we listened to foundry by john mackey and they had picked 20 seconds and make a graphic score for that That's so right. that was cool yeah definitely yeah so a lot of a lot of different ways to still be learning and mm -hmm. Yeah, even if you guys, like, went before you guys were able to play, like you said, yeah, so that's really cool. So uh, this kind of leads into the next question. So the new teaching style, has it allowed you to do anything that you maybe haven't been able to do in the past? Yeah, because, so, we know as band people, by the time you walk in the door, be it the first day of school, the first day of band camp, whatever, you are always preparing for something else. There's no day in the school year where you're not preparing for something except for maybe like we finished the winter concert and we're going on break and we finished graduation. But by the time you finish graduation, you're already like marching season's coming up in a month and a half. But so we're always, we're so used to go, 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 play, 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 prepare, 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 prepare. Um, and the kids still are already like, so are we having MPA? Does MPA happen this year? Have we scheduled MPA? Do we get to play MPA? And I'm like, we're so focused on this, prepare for concert, do concert, go to competition, get graded, like all this stuff that we don't get to focus a lot on this music history. Where did this music come from? Music diversity, learning about new composers, investigating someone cool who plays your instrument, uh, talking about music theory. This is how music works when you put it together. We get to do more of that now. Is this what we signed up for when we thought we were going to go be band teachers? No, because we all thought, I want to do my high school band experience. No offense, anybody. Yeah, we all want to be, originally when we go to school, we're like, I love band so much because usually it's my high school was awesome. I had a, such a good high school experience and I want to do that exact same thing. So we go into college going, I want to be my high school band director or I want to be my college band director. But really, you just have to go out and be you and... Right now, the you that we have to be is, who knows if there's going to be a competition this year? And you know what? That's okay. Because if you, I don't want to ruffle any feathers, but I am a very big proponent. This is me personally. I did not come from a competitive marching band. I came from a very successful wind band program, but I have never thought I do band so that I can get a cool trophy or I do band so I can get a medal to put on my jacket or a plaque to put on my wall. And there are some band directors that are like, and I don't, I don't have names. I, if I did, I wouldn't name names, but I know that there are people out there that exist like this that are like, I want to do band so that my band can be the best and win the biggest thing. And I can put all the trophies around my room mm -hmm. and we can be our best without winning trophies. And right now we have to find ways to do that because you know what? They canceled marching MPA and they might well cancel concert MPA. I think they've already decided to put uh, FMEA online mm. and I'm not sure. Don't quote me. This is now going to be on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> it's gospel. Um, Midwest this year um, is going to be completely virtual. So all those schools that made it to Midwest this year, like are getting pushed next year. So this is, I think this is going to make a lot of people realize what else there is to do with music that isn't preparing to win another thing. And you have to find out what's, what's important. Has your band program played a piece of music by a, a female composer? Has your band program played a piece of music by someone who identifies as LGBTQ? Do you know where to find composers who are LGBTQ? Can you name three composers who are who are black can you name composers of hispanic heritage can you personally name three pieces you've played by a uh, someone who is not a cis white male i asked my students the first week of school i was like all right guys have you ever played a piece by a female like a by a female composer and they were like uh, they pulled out one piece that was a arrangement of a Christmas song. Mm. But music isn't just people that look like, let me rephrase this before I sound 
like I don't want to sound mean to like I like there are lots and lots of lots of white males that I like <laughs> and so it always comes off as people are like everyone hates white men and I don't and I don't I look at Ryan's Ryan and I are super good friends <laughs> Um, but no, this, the better way to rephrase this is there is someone that looks like everybody that does all of the things. Um, and it is important that your students know that there was just a big argument on this on this sounds so dumb on the 2B phonium Facebook group. There was a big grump about female tuba players. And some guy was like, I don't think that there, this article should be titled tuba girls rule the world because if there was a thing that said tuba men rule the world, you would get all mad. And I'm like, well, because men have ruled the tuba world for so long and they still do. So it is still kind of a little bit cool to see another girl tuba player in a big situation because it breaks off the novelty. I don't want to be in something because someone thinks that I'm novel. Well, mm. it's like a girl center snare in like DCI, still kind of a novelty. And mm. we want to get to a point where it's not a novelty anymore. Um, you want it to just be commonplace. And that's what fighting for this stuff is. If it's just, you see that and you're like, okay, because it's so normal, but your students need to, know that they're right now they need to know that there are people that look like them that do what they do i didn't see a female tuba player i keep going to tuba players because that's just me that's my experience um i didn't see another female tuba player until i saw another high school student that was playing until i was in and like in high school and i did not see a professional female tuba player or hear about one until i had gosh near graduated college and that is too long i knew one female band director when i was in high school and she took a leap of absence. So I never got to like really work with her or see her. And I did not see any like collegiate female band directors until I had already graduated and I had gone to Midwest. So like people need to need to see that there are people out there that look like them. My school is very diverse. I have lots of kids that are from a lot of South American countries and it takes a little digging, but you like finding people that come from where they come from is important. So then they know they're not the only person that's done this or that if they want to go out and do this for their job, that there's people out there that have. So I think that's important. And this, this gives us kind of a chance to go do that. That's another one of my soapboxes. Sorry. <laughs> well, uh, that, uh, that's, that's perfect. Yeah, that, I, I love all that that you, that you said. Yeah, that's awesome. And that, and I was going to ask if you had yeah, advice and encouragement to give, but but that was a lot of a lot of advice right there. Yeah, that's, so that's awesome. Yeah, and it's cool that you have like the time to do that right now. I mean, despite mm -hmm. not definitely not trying to put a pandemic, you know, and, and under like you know, like not trying to make it like it's all good, yeah. but it's glad to hear that it's not all bad. Yeah, there's definitely stuff that we can do to kind of shine it up a little bit. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> do you have any topics that you would like uh, for future music educators to be aware of or know before they're getting into their uh, their first job let's see I, we kind of talked about the don't do everything a little bit sometimes kids won't succeed and it's not your fault especially if you've done everything that you possibly can also we as music people get especially like marching band in florida is like you are at school all of the time and you are doing things and you are never home the band director burnout is super real it's so real and it's, I've seen it at small places that don't go do marching band at other people's schools every other Friday because there are places in the country where you only play your home games and you don't have to travel. And then you come move to Florida and they go, oh no, we go to every game and you go, that's crazy. <laughs> and then they go, oh yeah, we do our full field show and we take a pit and you go, that's crazier. <laughs> Why are you driving around marimbas? That's silly, but it's what happens but you need to find time for you. You are defined by what you do outside of your job as well. And your friends didn't fall in love with band director you. Your friends fell in love with you. And if you become consumed by band director you, then the things that were important to you or are important to you will kind of slide away and you don't want that to happen. It is very important to keep some of your personal life and be able to have that time and it is hard to not feel guilty it is hard for me sometimes to come home and go i'm really tired i would like to make dinner watch some tv play a game or something and go to bed and i do not touch school stuff and sometimes that is very hard and i feel like i i have so much to do i have so much to do i have so much to do but 
I need that time to not be at school. You are paid for a certain amount of days and you are paid for a certain amount of hours and you are not paid for your time at home. Your marching band stipend does not cover you going home and working on stuff until midnight and then coming into school at five. Sometimes that's important, but also it's very important to find time for you to go do things that are, that you like to do that aren't band director you. Sleep. It sounds dumb. Sleep. You will not be 19 years old forever. You cannot function on four hours once you get older because it's a magic college thing. I don't know. We can all, we all did it slash you guys do it when you're in college. You're like, I can do three hours of sleep for a whole three weeks and I'm fine. (laughs) I work seven jobs. Like in college, I worked three jobs and on one day I went into one at three in the afternoon. I worked there until 545. I drove to my next job and I worked there from six until like 1 a.m. And then I drove to my next job and I worked like 1 a.m. to seven in the morning. And then I went to school all day. Yeah, it's, but you can do that in college because so, for some reason you are a superhuman individual that never needs sleep. When you get to a job, like a, a real grown up job where you're making a salary and you're dealing with smaller humans than you all day, you will be tired, especially now, and you will need time to sleep and to be a person that is not a band director person and you need to drink water. I am the pot calling kettle black here. Drink water because it's, that's the best thing. Sleep and water and take time for you. I think those are good things. Yeah, yeah, no, great things. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Well, Kirsten, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for taking time to, uh, to share some insight and some words of wisdom about percussion and like everything else. Um, great having you. So thank you. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Kirsten Hoopstraten. I learned a lot talking with her, and I hope you also learned a lot listening. Stay tuned for more interviews with band directors and orchestra directors in the future. That's it for now. I'm Ryan Bomey, and thanks again for tuning in to So You Want to Teach Percussion.